And Jesus, Jesus reaffirms the Old Testament in the book of Leviticus, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Hymn 372. Blessed be God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. Let us pray together the prayer printed in your insert. O Holy Spirit, you show me the way of Christ and open to me the gifts of God. Transform my everything to reflect your presence, Christ's sacrifice, and the Father's love. Help me to submit so that I may be truly free. Almighty and merciful God, it is only by your gift that your faithful people offer you true and laudable service. Grant that we may run without stumbling to obtain your heavenly promises through Jesus Christ our Lord who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. The first reading today is from the book of Deuteronomy. Now, this is the commandment the statutes and the ordinances that the Lord your God charged me to teach you to observe in the land that you are about to cross into and occupy, 
so that you and your children and your children's children may fear the Lord your God all the days of your life and keep all his decrees and his commandments that I am commanding, commanding you so that your days may be long. Hear therefore, O Israel, and observe them diligently so that it may go well with you and so that you may multiply greatly in a land flowing with milk and honey as the Lord, the God of your ancestors has promised you. Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your might. Keep these words that I am commanding you today in your heart. Recite them to your children and talk about them when you are at home and when you are away, when you lie down and when you rise. Bind them as a sign on your hand, fix them as an emblem on your forehead and write them on the doorposts of your house and on your gates. The word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Today's psalm can be found in your bulletin insert. We'll read it in unison. Happy are they whose way is blameless, who walk in the law of the Lord. Happy are they who observe his decrees and seek him with all their hearts, who never do any wrong, but always walk in his ways. You laid down your commandments that we should fully keep them Oh, that my ways were made so direct that I might keep your statutes. Then I should not be put to blame when I regard all your commandments. I will thank you with an unfeigned heart when I have learned your righteous judgments. I will keep your statutes. Do not utterly forsake me. The second reading is from the book of Hebrews. When Christ came as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and perfect tent, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes of a heifer sanctifies those who have been defiled so that their flesh is purified, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to worship the living God. The word of the Lord.
The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. One of the scribes came near and heard the Sadducees disputing with one another. And seeing that Jesus answered them well, he asked him, which commandment is the first of all? Jesus answered, the first is, hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, and with all your soul, and with all your mind, and with all your strength. The second is this, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other commandment greater than these. Then the scribe said to him, You are right, teacher. You have truly said that he is one, and besides him there is no other. And to love him with all your heart and with all your understanding and with all strength, and to love one's neighbor as oneself. This is much more important than whole burnt offerings and sacrifices. When Jesus saw that he had answered wisely, he said to him, you are not far from the kingdom of God. After that, no one dared ask him any more questions. The Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Yeah, so, so as we have entered into, um, you know, the lectionary is a wonderful and a blessing, a blessing to us, a tool for us to learn as we go through scripture, because as they formed the lectionary, the idea of the lectionary was to keep us within the, the idea of God's movement flowing through time, through, through the words of scripture. So, so you may have realized, as I think we do many Sundays, that when we read the gospel, you hear an echo of what we've already heard, perhaps in the first lesson or in the second lesson. And you may hear in the second lesson an echo of the first lesson. And you probably heard that today when I read the gospel, because Jesus has asked the question, what is the greatest commandment? And he says, uh, you know, uh, hear, O Israel, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, and your strength. And the second, we hear this again in the uh, right one service, right? And whenever we do right one, and the second commandment is like unto it, love your neighbor as yourself on these two commandments, hang all the law and the prophets. Well, he, Jesus did something here, which is really cool, but you may realize that the first part of this, which was not what you heard before, hear, O Israel, was what we heard in the first lesson, all right? Back here in the book of Deuteronomy in our first lesson, Moses said, and now you remember what Deuteronomy is. The, the children of Israel have been liberated from bondage in Egypt. They have crossed the desert. Now they are sitting at the, uh, at the uh, river, the Jordan River. They are about to cross over into the land flowing with milk and honey. They are taking their rest. But Moses is not going. Moses had been naughty early on, and he can't go. He has to stay, so he doesn't get to cross over. So he is retelling the story of the Exodus and retelling the story of God's blessing to the people one more time. But who are the people? They're a new generation. So many of those who had been liberated from Egypt had died in the desert. They'd been in the desert a long time, right? So, so many had died away. And who had come up? These 40-year-olds whose life was spent in the desert, maybe a little bit of time in Egypt. But as a child, as a four-year-old or five-year-old, they don't remember slavery in Egypt. They remember the transition through the desert. And so they have open minds and open spirits to hear the word of God again and in a new way, to receive something that they hadn't understood and applied in their life in a new place and a new time. It's all new now. Everything, the potential for starting over is here for everyone. And so Moses says, hear, O Israel. That, by the way, is called the Shema. And the Shema is simply the words here, hear, hear, O Israel. Shema, Shema, O Israel. Shema is like the creed. If you are if you are a, a, a Jewish person and you know, someone said the Shema, this is your creed because Moses is saying, God is saying this, this is what you have to say. And you know something about scripture when you hear scripture read or you envision scripture in your mind? You know when I, I hear a lot of Old Testament, especially on Moses, you know what I, I picture in my mind? Charlton Heston. 
Of course, that's a generational thing that's being lost these days. But there are others, new, new um, actors that are like him. And you know, Charlton Heston was always kind of, err. And I, I, I have tried to get away from that understanding or that picture in my mind of that kind of dead tone, murder. You know, this is alive. This stuff is fun. This is exciting. You can imagine he's out there going, hey, everybody, listen up. I got some news for you. I got something for you to learn, something for you to hear, something that's going to open your heart and your mind, something that you're going to take with you and give to your kids and your children's children, children. Hear, O Israel, God our God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your mind and all your soul and all your strength and every bit of your body and your being. Give everything you have over to God and be made whole. Can you see that happening? Instead of Charles Heston going, love the Lord your God with all your heart and soul. I'm like, oh. So he's saying, and, but there's something different if you were listening closely, if you read this closely. It says in the Old Testament, Deuteronomy says, the Lord your God the Lord, I love the Lord, the Lord, your, Lord, the Lord is our God, the Lord alone. And when Jesus is asked in the gospel, he says, the hero Israel, the Lord, our God, the Lord is one. And the Pharisee repeats it back. You're right, teacher, by saying the Lord is one. Did he get it wrong? Did the teacher get it wrong? How come they said alone here in Deuteronomy? This is Moses. I mean, he couldn't have it wrong. It's Charlton Heston, for God's sakes. Or is it Jesus that got it wrong? Well, what happened? Or maybe a translation. I loved when I hear that people say, the translations are all wrong. Okay, so let's just look at it. This word alone is echad in the Hebrew, okay? And this word is used as it is defined in the Old Testament, alone. Now, what does that mean? The first definition, actually, there are three definitions for this word. God, our God, is ours alone, all right? So, so Moses is telling the children of Israel, you have been with me in the desert for 40 years. Who else has been with us? We've been alone wandering around in the desert for 40 years. Who does that? Are they just going to run into another tribe of people wandering around in the desert for 40 years? They have not had exposure to other peeps, right? They've been by themselves. So this is their God, their God alone. But now they're going to cross over the River Jordan into the land of milk and honey, which is also known as Canaan. And the Canaanites are there and the Hittites are there and other people are there and they're going to run to these people and they have their own gods, different gods, strange gods, maybe fun gods, attractive gods, gods I'd like to get to know because they do cool stuff. So now Moses is saying in this time, he's saying, as you go, this is your God. God, our God, is ours alone. Don't go into this other land and take on these other gods. This is our God and our God alone. Now, this is not to say that other people cannot come and receive this God. That's not it. In fact, the, the Jewish people have a, had a tradition where those who wanted to convert to Judaism would be called God-fearers and would brought into the fold. Uh, is kind of problematic because even though they were God fearers and now they were in the fold, they're not really fully Jewish. So in the temple, for instance, you had the, the big temple, Solomon's temple, and you had the, the court for the women because the women couldn't go in the inner court. Sorry, but, but they also had the court for the God fearers. They couldn't go in there either. So you're never really fully one with the rest of them. You're kind of the point is that your God, if you are part of this tribe, if you're part of the Jewish people, your God is yours alone. It's not, you don't have another God. You're not sharing God's time with another God. We, for instance, today, we're not Unitarians. We're not Universalists. We are Christians. We have one God. We have one God alone. That's our God, right? So this is how it's used in the teaching that is made for the children of Israel. And it's to expand their minds. It's to blow up their spirit and say, look, you have been in the desert You've only had this. This is all you've known. You're going to see a whole new life out there. So open up your mind because you're going to see this. Don't get confused by it. Remember, though, in this opening of your mind and your spirit, that there is one thing you can depend on. This is our God alone. Don't be trying. Don't be coming. No, none of this folding stuff. Our God alone. Now, there is another use of this word, achad, in in the, on the Old Testament. And this is also an illegitimate use of this word. It is first or, or has the greatest precedence. That God, if you put that in there, you want to talk about it later because it is used later on, that's saying God has precedence in my life. God is, God is above all other things, not just 
above another God, but God is first and foremost in my life. And this is born out of what's said yet. next, right? It says, if you change it and you say, God, our Lord, the Lord is God, the Lord is, has precedence. Then you say, you shall love this God who has precedence in your life with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, all your strength. Above all other things, above your husband, above your wife, above your children, above your dog, above your gerbil, above your tea, above everything you've got. This God gets the blessing by you above all things. He's first. God is first among all things. And there's a third definition, and you know what it is. What is it? One. So in the New Testament, in the, in the gospel lesson today, the Pharisee says, what is the commandment? And he says, God, our God is one. One. Now, Pharisee may have heard something different than what Jesus was saying. Because one is just one, isn't it? But even at that time, there was a strong debate going on about what the book of Genesis was telling everybody about the creation story, that God actually sounds a lot like two. That God was the God who created it, and then there was another part of God that was doing the work, the word. It was going out and doing this stuff. And so there was a debate within it. So when Jesus said, our God is one, and the Pharisee replied, yes, you're right, our God is one, this could have been a reply to that argument that was going on, but it wasn't what Jesus meant. And we hear that in a few minutes. Now let me stop for a minute and let's put the, the gospel in context so we can get it all, all set today. Remember last week? You don't remember last week. It was the healing of blind Bartimaeus. Okay, this is chapter 10 in the Mark's gospel. We skipped over chapter 11. You know, we're in 12 now. Why do we do that? Oh, those, those pesky people writing the lectionary, what do they do? It's because the beginning of chapter 11, Jesus is going into Jerusalem. And what happens when he goes in Jerusalem? Putting your palms on the ground and your coats on the ground. So that we call that Palm Sunday. So that's coming up. That's later on, right? So they skip over it because... They are, we're going to get to that at another time, and, and we need to stay with this, this teaching, this continuity of teaching in the gospel that goes all the way back to, to the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch, all the way back to Genesis, this showing the continuity of God through Scripture. You need to stay with that in the lectionary so we can keep our minds in focus. Now, what happened with Bartimaeus last week? Just a short little review, right? Bartimaeus, the Jewish tradition is that if, if uh, Marion here is struck blind, then we would say that she has done some horrible sin that we don't know about, but we now know about it. We don't know what it is, but we know it's horrible because God has struck her blind. And we're not going to associate with her anymore because she's a sinner. And of course, we're not. Right? So we're going to kick her out. She can't come to church anymore. No one's going to give her food. No one's going to give her anything. She's just gone. She's going to have to sit by the door and beg. And if we are really nice and we give her money, it's because we are like getting brownie points with God because we're giving something to the little peon lady. So what happens when you have this ha when she has this happen is she's not only lost her sight, but she's ejected from the kingdom. She's lost her family. Her own family will ostracize her. They may care for her like in the shed in the back, but they won't be public with her at all. And she's lost the rest of you. She's ostracized. So when God, through Christ, when Jesus gives her, her sight back, he not only heals her sight, that was really cool, Congratulations. But now, because she's been healed in her sight, she's invited back into the family. She's restored into her community. A second big group of miracle was that the community gets her back. The family is, gets her back. It's a miracle. She's been forgiven. Look, she's got her eyesight back. This had never happened before. How can this happen? God punishes her for some horrible, horrible sin and then unpunishes her, forgives her sin, restores her eyesight? What is that? That doesn't happen. That just doesn't happen. So this is God. This is Jesus. Remember Jesus when he raised Lazarus when he said, he prayed, he cried, he prayed. He said, oh God, Father, thank you for doing this because it's not for me. Thank you for doing this because it's for them so they can see this happen, that this is not permanent, that sin is not death, that death is not death, that there is life after death and it belongs to you and you can bring it back. All of these miracles about the healing of people and restoring them from their place of ostracization and sin 
back to the community was Jesus blowing up the mind and the spirit of the people saying, look larger. Your God needs to be bigger. This Remember that old book I keep talking about, Oswald Chambers, Your God is Too Small, that little pamphlet from the 1800s where he said, you have all, you've, if you don't go to church, if you don't learn this stuff, you're going to put God in this little tiny box. And you're going to think that that's God. And a great way to say that is, I was talking to someone yesterday about, about uh, Kilmarnock when I was there, and we had these, these, this situation we called church widows. All the wives were in church, and all the husbands were not. And where were they? They were on the back of their boats. They're out fishing on Sunday morning off, off in the bay. And so I ran to one of the guys, and I said, well, you know, what are you doing? He says, I see God in the fish. And I see God in the waves, and I see God in the seagulls. The seagull cries, and I hear the cry of the seagull. It's God. I said, that is beautiful. God gave us all of creation. Look at these banners to represent that. God gave us all of creation that we might look out and see the beauty and wonder of all that God has given us and thank God for it. I said, but you know, if that's all you've got, then God will always only be the cry of the seagull. He'll only be the crash of the waves. He'll only be the jump of the fish. He'll only be the spray in your face. God can't be more than that because you don't know any more than that. And all the feelings you invest in the feeling of God are your feelings of God. God will only be as big as your feeling. You can't explode God more than that. So this teaching that Jesus has done for Bartimaeus is to explode the idea of sin, explode the idea of God's presence, explode the idea of God's love and mercy. Okay, so now Jesus has entered into Jerusalem after this miracle. And when he gets into Jerusalem after Palm Sunday, he gets confronted by all these people that are not happy about all these miracles. And one of those people are the Herodians. These are Pharisees who are politically connected to Herod. Remember Herod? If you watched uh, Jesus Christ Superstar, could you ever forget Herod if you see that movie? (laughs) One of my favorites of all time. Um, Herod was a Roman sympathizer. He liked the Romans. They gave him money and things. And the Herodians wanted Jesus to be on their team. So they went to Jesus and gave him that test. Remember, should we pay our taxes to Caesar? So they tested him. Didn't work. Then the Sadducees came along. Remember, they don't believe in the resurrection of the dead. And they want Jesus on their team, or they want to be able to discredit him in front of everybody else. And they posed another question to him. It didn't work. And that's where we come to today with the Pharisees that are not Herodians, are saying, oh, he really, he really gave it to the Sadducees because they didn't like the Sadducees. So maybe I can talk to him and he'll be on our team. So he asks him this question, and Jesus does a great job with this one. And he answers the question. You can imagine that Pharisee's going, oh boy, he's on our team. I'm going to get to go back to the guys and tell them he's one of us. It's one of the only places in Scripture where we see somebody complimenting Jesus on being right good teacher, you're right. You did a good job. Way to go. So he tells him this. It's done a good job. Well done. Echoes it back to him again. Uses that one, God is one. Changes it from from ours alone to God, to one. And then says this added thing. This is more important than all the offerings and all the burnt offerings and all the sacrifices you can make. We heard that in in, uh, Hebrews today, second lesson. He entered once and for all into the holy place, not with the blood of goats and calves or sacrifices, for the blood and goats and bulls with the sprinkling of the ashes on the heifer, that the sacrifice that he made had a different origin. It had a different place. It wasn't an obligation that I, that I make or that Jesus made. Jesus didn't go in like you and I would go in and make an obligation, an obligatory gift to God because, well, that's what we're supposed to do. God's gift in Christ was a gift of something else. What was it? Love. Loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son. What greater gift is there? What greater love is there than that someone lay down their life for their friend? I give up everything, not because I have to, but because I want to, because I sacrifice myself out of love for you, for the other. Christ sacrificed out of love for everybody, for all of us. Hebrews is saying this, says you don't have to do these things anymore. Then, in fact, you shouldn't do these things anymore. In fact, you shouldn't regard anything in your life as a sacrifice to God. God doesn't want the sacrifice if the sacrifice is not formed in love. If the sacrifice is an obligation that I do because I have to do it, then it's going to be held at abeyance. It's going to be held back. 
It's going to be put a feather in my cap or tap me on the back because I had to give a sacrifice and I did it. Remember that, hands on the hip. This is based not on that. This is based on the fact that I love. Does anybody, um, does anybody love anybody? Anybody love anyone? So if you really love somebody, you know this. You do things for them because you love them. I've gotten a bad reputation in my house because my kids say, Dad, can you? And before they're done, I'm up out of my chair and I'm running down the hallway. Like, don't always do that, right? <laughs> because I said, nah. I love them. I want them to know how much I love them. I want them to know that I'm there, even when I'm busy. I want them to know I love them. This gift of love is running to someone to give them, not because you have to, but because you love them. So he gets done saying this is more important than sacrifices and better than all that. No obligation anymore. And Jesus says this, you are not far from the kingdom of God. I know what the guy thought. You can imagine what he thought. He thought, huh, <laughs> hand on the hip. I've done a great job. I've got it right. Teacher and I are on the same path. Must be a Pharisee. I'm going to go back and tell the guys. And, and I know that what he's saying is that I am here on this earth, and when I die, I get to go to heaven because I'm not far from the kingdom of God. That's what that means, and that's not what he meant at all. And that's not what he meant at all when he said, God, our God is one. What he was saying to him was, you have a, I believe in you. He answered wisely. I believe that you have the faith. I believe that you're searching. I believe your intention is good, but you've got God in this little box. I'm trying to explode that box. God, our God of one is not the God of one that you think. It is the God who stands before you. It is the two that's told about and the three that will become known in the book of Genesis in the words of Moses, you need to look at me. You came to me to understand, know, and understand this. It is God to whom you speak. God, our God, is one. The one you think of, the one that you know in your scripture, in your tradition, and the one who stands before you. I am one. We are one. But you didn't get that, so you're close, but you're not there. Isn't that sad to get close and not be there? especially if we're close and we're not there because we decide not to go any further. I've never understood that. Does that make sense to anybody? Let me put it in really easy terms. I'm going to go, ah, I I'm going to go to Darian's house. She's having a party. Going over to Darian's house, and I get directions. And it's, a, it's another place I don't know, and so I look at my, my Google Maps, and I go in the directions, and I arrive, and I pull over, and I'm happy, and I'm all dressed up, and, I, and I'm sitting in a vacant lot downtown. Like, what? So I get on the phone and I say, hey, hey, Darren, Darren, I'm coming to the party. I'm all dressed up. She says, great. I said, yeah, I'm sitting in the vacant lot underneath the train stay in the train tracks downtown. It's like, oh, oh, you missed it. You're close. Does it make any sense for me to say, oh, I'm close. Okay, thanks. And hang up. Like, I'm going to sit here for two hours because I gave myself two hours to be at the party. This is where I'm going to sit, and then I'm going to go home, because I was close. Never understood that. Wouldn't I get the dress and then leave and go to the party? As soon as I found out I was close, wouldn't I want to go? Unless I, I was so committed to keeping my God in that little box, that little tiny place. And unless getting to that place was the most important thing to me, but not actually arriving. I want to think, I want to pray, I want to hold, hold out that the Pharisee heard that and was one of those people present at Pentecost that, that went the extra step and made it. I want to think that. I don't know. This is the place where God in Christ, where Jesus opens our minds and our spirits to what's happening. And he does this in another way in this teaching because he attaches something to that one lesson. He attaches to the Deuteronomy lesson, a lesson from Leviticus. And that lesson in Leviticus is love your neighbor as yourself. And then we know on these two commandments hang all the law, whoops, and the prophets. Oh, Pharisee, there you go, because the Sadducees didn't accept the prophets. So he's got to be right, right? This is good. What does that mean? On these two commandments, what's the second one he's giving him? Love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, your soul, your mind. Love, love, sacrifice. Love the Lord your God with all your heart. 
love your neighbor, love yourself. On that hangs everything. Everything. This is a very, very hugely missed big thing in the Bible. To fully comprehend, to fully receive God and all that God has to give us, we have got to love ourselves. Not like the person in the mirror. That's not it. Love ourselves. Love ourselves. So when we don't accept God's forgiveness, when we hang on to some grief in our life, when we stay stuck in the moment where God is fits in this nice little image, we are not loving ourselves. We're not, because God does not love us that way, that we are staying in that place. God loves us to bring us from that place, to show us the way out of that place of stuckness and restriction. Only when I'm able to do that do I truly love myself because God loves me. God died for me. The love that God gave in God's self to die for me is the love that God wants me to have and to experience in myself. Remember the thing we say? We are, you are, you as a single person and individual are the most important person to God on the face of the planet. It's a, it's a God, it's a, it's a, uh, um, the Mobius strip thing. It's a, it's a, uh, a wonderful conundrum. Each one of us is the one loved by God more than all others. Each one of us. Because we are to know that. You are to know that in your body, in your mind, in your spirit, in your soul. You are loved by God more than all other things in the universe. And knowing that love, you are to reflect it back out. How can I be less knowing that I am loved more? You know how if anybody, I, I don't know if I asked this question earlier, does anybody love anybody? <laughs> Do you remember, if it hasn't happened recently, I pray it does like today. Do you remember what it's like when you look in the face of another person and you know truly that you are loved? You know that feeling? And in that moment, everything is okay. Everything is okay. Because with all your foibles and all your brokens and all your everything, you are loved. And nothing in the world in that moment can change it. And, and, until like five minutes later when, you know, <laughs> when, when it wears off a little bit. That's the way God wants us to realize our life all the time. Because God loves us that way, not for just five minutes, for all the time. To love myself means that I can accept God's forgiveness for who I am and what I've done unconditionally, sin-free in the love of God. doesn't mean I won't sin again, but in this, in this understanding, I'm sin-free in the love of God. And because of that, I can forgive the one who has sinned against me. Does that line sound familiar? We're going to be saying it in a few minutes. You may say it all the time, every day, perhaps. Forgive them their trespasses as I am forgiven mine. How, how can I forgive the trespass, the sin of the other, unless I accept the forgiveness for my own? We think we can, we can't. This is why we can keep grudges. This is why we can stay angry. Why we can blame people and hold it against them. This is why we can hold them up later on as an example of all the terrible things in my life, in the world. Because I'm guilty. I haven't accepted it myself, and I cannot give it to someone else. It's the most important commandment. Oh my gosh, how could we miss this? This is God saying, I want you to be free. I want you to be free. You have to be free. You're my child. Be free. Know my love and grow and be free and wonder and joy and happiness and prosperity. I, I want this for you. What parent does not want this for their child? Psalm said, and we said it together, happy are they who are blameless, happy are they who observe his decrees. 
who never does any wrong. You all read that and go, that's stupid. <laughs> that was such a wannabe thing to say. It's not. You know why it's not? Because you're going to go on sinning in here. This, this, this psalmist is saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to break it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to sin. But I'm gonna, I'm, in breaking it and sinning, I'm going to fix it. I'm going to come back to God. I'm going to know when it happened. I'm going to find out when, and I'm going to turn back to God, and I'm going to give it back to God, and I'm going to ask God to forgive me, and I'm going to know it. I'm going to live it. And I'm not going to wear my, my, my grief and my guilt and my sin and my blame around my neck and be dragged around the rest of my life by it and blame it on other people. I'm going to give it back to God and I'm going to accept it. And then I'm going to live this life of joy and felicity and wonder and grace and mercy in the presence of my Lord. It's, it goes on and on. It revolves. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments hang everything. Be free. Amen. Please stand with me. Together we will say the Nicene Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he became incarnate from the Virgin Mary and was made man. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son. With the Father and the Son, he is worshipped and glorified. He has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Father, we pray for your holy Catholic Church. Grant that every member of the church may truly and humbly serve you. We pray for all bishops, priests, and deacons. We pray for all who govern and hold authority in the nations of the world. Give us grace to do your will in all that we undertake. Have compassion on those who suffer from any grief or trouble. Give to the departed eternal rest. We praise you for your saints who have entered into joy. Let us pray for our own needs and those of others. 
We pray especially this morning for all members of our parish family and extended family whom we find on our prayer list. We pray for those of our parish family who are traveling this week or this weekend. We pray for their safety. We continue and always pray for the young people of our parish family and young people everywhere, whether they're home or away at school. We pray as they face challenges and, and decisions. We pray for wisdom and strength and courage and faith. We pray for patience and wisdom for those who would mentor them. Gracious God, we thank you that you have given us this beautiful day and this beautiful place that we may come together and grow in our knowledge and love of you and understand better, opening our minds and hearts and spirits to your presence through your word. We ask you to give us a new insight into our lives through the grace and mercy of your love. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We pray to you also for the forgiveness of our sins. Have mercy upon us, most merciful Father. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things done and left undone. And so uphold us by your spirit, that we may live and serve you in newness of life, to the honor and glory of your name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, have mercy on you, forgive you all your sins through our Lord Jesus Christ, strengthen you in all goodness, and by the power of the Holy Spirit, keep you in eternal life. Amen. The peace of the Lord be always with you. Please be seated. Good morning and welcome on this beautiful, beautiful day. I pray that your week is going well and, and uh, you'll look forward to the, something fantastic today. I myself am leaving with Will. We're going to go uh, across the state to go mountain biking for a few days. Yeah, that's great. So pray for me as I travel with him and as we, uh, as we ride and make sure that we are safe and, and healthy and things are all great and terrific. Please. Lots of announcements here in the bulletin, as always, ask you to follow along with those and make sure that there's nothing new that you haven't already picked up on, which there's usually is something new. One of, the, one of the new things is that our Bible study is finished up with Habakkuk and we're going on to Zechariah. So if you would like to join us, seven o'clock, we get together on Thursday nights and we just greet and meet a little bit. And then we go on to a small prayer service and 730 we jump into the book, so we'll be starting up in the book of Zechariah. If we have time, it's not Zechariah. Am I doing it wrong? Zephaniah. Zephaniah. Sorry. Oh, those Zephi people, I tell you. Zephaniah, not Zechariah. Gosh, Zephaniah. Um, and if we have time, which we may or may not, depending on, the, on how long we take in each book, remember that Advent starts the 28th of November. That's just a month away. So we have just four weeks uh, to go through this part of the Old Testament. If we can't make it, maybe we'll pick up on the back end of our Advent program uh, as that starts, or we'll keep it going through Advent uh, on Thursday nights. Are there other announcements from the bulletin or announcements that are not in the bulletin? Just, uh, we have some requests for Yesterday, as you see the beautiful um, garlands that we have on the end of the pews right here, it was the celebration of life of Vanessa Dooling, Vanessa Preston and Darian's mother and grandmother. Uh, we had the funeral here yesterday. It was a beautiful uh, funeral for her and time for her and for people to gather as it is. Uh, and this, these are the, um, the, some of the food stuffs that were there for that celebration. And it's really, really appropriate to continue to partake of those gifts uh, on Resurrection Day, right? Every Sunday we celebrate the resurrection. So it's a really appropriate for us to celebrate that with, with Vanessa who's here, yay, it's great. And Darian who are here uh, after they have uh, celebrated the cel celebration service yesterday. The internment 
the, is a graveside service for Vanessa on Wednesday at 11 a.m. at Forest Lawn Cemetery. And you are welcome to come to that. Just get there maybe five or eight minutes early, 10 minutes early if you would like to come as an open time. If, you, if you've been to a graveside service, you know it doesn't go that long, but it is a wonderful service and stands alone as that. So please, please come. Any other announcements? Okay, birthdays. Jim, you didn't think you were going to get away, did you? Not so <laughs> All right, so tell everybody who you are and when's your birthday. Jim, my birthday is tomorrow. Outstanding. Okay, you want to come over here? You can stand or kneel. We'll say a prayer. There we go. Let us pray. Gracious God, we give you thanks, so much thanks and praise for this life and for this place that you have given to us. Thank you so much for the beauty and wonder of your creation. We thank you that you have placed us here and given us faculties and, and the ability to appreciate and to live and to love and to serve. We thank you this morning, especially for your servants, Steve and Jim and Jenny. We thank you that you have filled them with a sense of calling and presence and brought them to this place and this time and opened their hearts and minds to your word and to your wisdom and to your spirit. We ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to bless them, rest upon them, dwell within them, hold them up, make them strong, keep them healthy, give them the wisdom of this life and the life beyond, help them to live this life in your love and to seek out others through your love and to transcend their own moments of life by your love. We ask you to prosper them as they seek after you in wisdom, as they understand the words of scripture and the presence of your life and love through the words of scripture and in their life as they live. We ask you to continue to raise them up as servants in your church and to bless them in ministry and service to others and to make them strong witnesses, both within the church and without the church, to those who are in such need of one God, of you alone. Holy Spirit, we ask your blessing, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit upon them this day and forevermore. Amen. Amen. Happy birthday. Happy birthday. Anniversaries. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten son to the end who all who believe in him should not perish, but have everlasting life.
in two kinds. If you would like to come forward and just receive the bread, that's fine. And if you'd like to receive the wine as well, just proceed up and, and we're receiving by intinction. I would tell you to go slow, no, no hurry, just be deliberate, take your time. We're not going anywhere. After you receive the, the, uh, uh, the wine and then you proceed on back to your pew. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth, for the wonderful grace and virtue declared in all your saints who have been your chosen vessels of grace and the lights of the world in their generations. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with angels and archangels and with all the company of heaven who forever sing this hymn to proclaim the glory of your name. Gracious Father, in your infinite love, you made us for yourself. And when we had fallen into sin and become subject to evil and death, you, in your mercy, sent Jesus Christ, your only and eternal Son, to share our human nature, to live and die as one of us, to reconcile us to you, the God and Father of all. He stretched out his arms upon the cross and offered himself in obedience to your will, a perfect sacrifice for the whole world. On the night he was handed over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus Christ took bread, and when he had given thanks to you, he broke it and gave it to his disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body, which is given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. After supper, he took the cup of wine. And when he had given thanks, he gave it to them and said, Drink this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant, which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this for the remembrance of me. Therefore, we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. We celebrate the memorial of our redemption, O Father, in this sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving. Recalling his death, resurrection, and ascension, we offer you these gifts. Sanctify them by the power of your Holy Spirit to be for your people the body and blood of your Son. The holy food and drink of new and unending life in him. Sanctify us also that we may faithfully receive this holy sacrament and serve you in unity, constancy, and peace. And at the last day, bring us with all your saints into the joy of your eternal kingdom. All this we ask through your Son, Jesus Christ, by him and with him and in him, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, 
All honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Alleluia, Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Therefore, let us keep the feast. Alleluia, the gifts of God for the people of God. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. The blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. <laughs> the body of Christ, the bread of heaven. 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 Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. 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 The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. Amen. Body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen. The body of Christ, the bread of heaven. Amen.
Let us pray. Eternal God, Heavenly Father, you have graciously accepted us as living members of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. And you have fed us with spiritual food in the sacrament of his body and blood. Send us now into the world in peace and grant us strength and courage to love and serve you with gladness and singleness of heart through Christ our Lord. Amen. The blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be upon you this day and remain with you always. Amen. Hallelujah. Let us go forth into the world rejoicing in the power of the Spirit. Thanks be to God. Hallelujah.